So what we did uh, last class is we just I just introduced myself, kind of give my background, and um, had you guys ask questions. It's nice to see that I haven't scared you off. That's good. Um, and then the assignment was just uh, this kind of questionnaire, just to help me get to understand your background and where you're coming from, um, and introduce us to the first topic, which is what is philosophy? We want to know what it is, if we're going to be studying it. So um, feel free to contribute if you want, because I've just popped it up here. It also can be found on your site under files. But let's see. And I'll just go around the room and ask some of you. You can also volunteer if you want. Have you ever been exposed to philosophy or to philosophical works? If so, provide details. Now, it doesn't just have to be books. It could be cinema, cartoons, art, um, anything that you think would constitute as an exposure to philosophy. Anybody? Yes, sir. Rick and Morty. Rick and Morty. Okay, good. W what else? Really? Wow, nice. Is that good? That's exposure to philosophy. Who else thinks they've been exposed or read something philosophical? Yes. I've been reading Bobby Ramdas's short work. Yeah, he was a psychologist out of Harvard. Um, let's see, who else had a hand up? Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, really? How are you finding it? Yeah, that's like the most difficult. When, um, where I went to grad school, uh, it's like one of the leading colleges in the world for Heidegger. They have some really big Heidegger scholars there. And when I got into the program, we were doing this class on Heidegger and we we're reading it. Sometimes we get this imposter's uh, syndrome where it's like, man, I'm an idiot and I've just somehow fooled them into thinking that, yeah, we can let them in. And that's the feeling I had when I was reading Heidegger. And everybody was talking about Heidegger. I'm like, wow, everybody's so smart. And I have no idea what this is saying. Um, it's some of the most difficult, complicated language in philosophy. And as you'll find, I'm bringing this up because you'll find this to be the case, too, when you're reading through philosophy, is that at first it seems completely unintelligible. And as you plow through and you work through, um, and again, I suggest that when you come across words that you don't know, make a glossary. Look it up in an online philosophical dictionary and write those out so that when you come across them again, which you will, you can just look in your little glossary of notes and say, I know what that word means. So it's kind of what I did with Heidegger and worked through. And guess what the first thing I noticed was? Nobody else knew what they were talking about. It's like, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about, but at least I got to the level that I'm realizing that everybody else is just talking, and they have no idea what they're actually talking about. Um, and that can tend to happen when, if you don't know the material and people are speaking as if they are an authority on the matter, I guess you just assume, wow, I, they're really smart. and they. So again, just plow through you'll start to get it and you'll start to realize that half of this, if not more, is just simply learning a new vocabulary. Yeah. Other philosophical works that you've been exposed to? Movies, books, music. How about number two? If someone asked you, what is philosophy? What would you tell them philosophy is? Now, I ask this question because before I was introduced to philosophy, which was, I think, my senior year of high school we had, I told you a philosopher come in and lecture on logic and philosophy. I had some strange ideas about what philosophy was. And obviously, as you get exposed to the material philosophy and the subject matter, that's going to change. But it is interesting to look and see that 
what did I think philosophy was? Now that I've been exposed, what do I actually think philosophy is? Uh, I probably had an idea of, yeah, people with beards on a mountain saying, like, wise but maybe uh, very unpractical things. Uh, like I mentioned last class, somebody says, uh, you have to make time in the day for, and the philosopher jumps in says, no, you don't make time. Time makes you. And everybody's like, wow, it's so deep. So I thought it was kind of this, just a bunch of men on a mountain writing out fortune cookies and proverbial phrases that, um, in fact, because I really didn't know what I wanted to do in high school, um, I thought, well, I wonder if I could be a philosopher. And I wrote out a bunch of stupid witisms that, um, so obviously that's, we'll find out that's probably not what it is, but it's not too far off in the sense of, you know, wisdom or something like that. But what's even more strange is what other people thought philosophers and philosophy was. You might have heard this one. Ooh, you're a philosopher. I don't exist. Uh, it's like, what are you talking about? Hey, man, I'm a philosopher. Aren't you guys running around thinking, how do I know I exist? I don't exist. It's like, yeah, it's not philosophy. That's called drug abuse. <laughs> Or we're having a psychiatric problem. We need to get you, uh, what's the code, the 5150? Got 5150 here. <laughs> um, now I know how that happens, and we'll find out. How many people remember the telephone game? Where it's like I tell something, and then it goes down, and it's just completely butchered and retarded by the time you get down to the end of the, it's like, my dog is on a roof flying a car. It's like, What? Um, this is probably something that's happened. It was Descartes who actually asked the question, um, how, what can I know for certain? And he questioned his own existence for the purpose of not saying, hey, I don't exist, but to prove that without a shadow of a doubt, I cannot be thinking I and be questioning that I exist at the same time really easy. If you hear anybody say, I don't know if I exist, all you have to say is, who, who asked that question? Was it you? Was it? Oh, you. You, the one thinking you don't exist, is saying you don't exist? You're asking. The, there has to be an I, a person, to be raising the question and doubting they exist. That was Descartes' purpose. Now, you can imagine somebody that hadn't studied philosophy and just heard that through the telephone, through the telephone game. By the time it gets to, you know, out 50 people, it's now philosophers are so stupid, they're all running around thinking they don't exist. Um, I imagine that's my best stab at how people come up with weird ideas like that. I've heard even stranger ones. Oh, philosopher, are you? Well, you'll never get a job with that. That's always the famous one. Um, yes, I'll give you some uh, information, fact. Uh, more employers tend to hire philosophers. And philosophy, and we'll, we'll discuss this later, is actually one of the most practical degrees that you could get. There's very few, I mean, apart from kind of like a technical degree where you get, you know, um, like in a trade school or something like that, pieces of paper are not going to land you a job. It's you that's going to land the job. So you have to start thinking in terms of, well, what's going to prepare me best such that I'll be empowered enough to achieve the career that I want? Um, I'm going to argue philosophy. And employers see that too. They're hiring more and more philosophers. Um, the other strange one is, oh, you're a philosopher, so we could just be like people on a planet that's a cell that's like on an ant, on an ant farm, on a continent that's on another planet that's a cell on, it's like, again, with the drug abuse. I don't <laughs> know what, it's not philosophy. Um, but what do you guys, if somebody asked you today, well, oh, you're taking a philosophy class, what's philosophy? What's your best stab at that? What would you guys say? Oh, P 
pure concentrated thought. I have some in a bottle here if you want. <laughs> pure concentrated thought. That's pretty cool, huh? That's my new band. Pure concentrated thought. <laughs> That's cool. Um, other other um, attempts to... Somebody asks you later today, what is philosophy? What are you going to tell them? I think it might be. Mm-hmm. Basically, I wrote philosophy or your perspective on any given understanding of the universe. Okay, good. Good. Uh, let's get some more. Philosophy is. I think the way that he studies ideas and also like the science and a lot of times it's used as like a science experiment for like people that are completely different from Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, but did everybody get her all? Get, that's fine. I'm up. Might as well just. Hit that. So, it, who didn't sign? Oh, okay. Yeah, just pass around. If your name's not on there, just you can sign below. Um, what else? Who else wants to take a stab? What is philosophy? How would you describe philosophy? Yes, sir. Based on belief. Based on belief. Yeah. Good. Again, don't worry about right or wrong answers. We're just brainstorming. We can refine these, change them if we want. Logical thinking. What else? Now, the reason why I have science up here is that Aristotle says, look, if you have something that's obscure, that's not quite clear, Right now, maybe it's philosophy. We don't really know what philosophy is at this point. Aristotle says, what you don't want to do is then go for an example, something that's just as obscure or more obscure. That is not going to be elucidating as an example or explaining what's not so clear to you. For example, if a child, a little child wants to know well, how does the mechanics of a bike work when you, what you, you're seeing with the child is that here is something that's obscure to the child that they don't understand. And what you don't want to do is go, well, son, you see Werner Heisenberg explains in his uh, uncertainty principle that you never know the, the exact position of velocity of, uh, it's like, no, no, don't, <laughs> you've just made it even more complicated. You go to something that's better known and more clear, just explain what's less clear. Now, although we might not be science majors, we definitely know what science is because we live in a modern scientific age. And therefore, it helps to use something like that that's more clear to compare and contrast with something that's not so clear. So that we begin to see the similarities and differences so that hopefully at the end, we're able to at least get a working definition of what we think philosophy is. So let's start. And by the way, um, notice that I put up here the empirical sciences, also known as the hard or positive sciences. And the reason why I say that because we'll get into, there is a kind of classic traditional notion of science um, that's more broad than what we would refer to when you hear somebody say, oh, I'm taking some science classes. Typically what you think of are the hard empirical or positive sciences. Well, so let's first start, what do I mean by the hard empirical sciences? Thank you, everybody got this? um, When you're done, just pass that back. Let's give examples of a discipline that you think would qualify as a hard, a positive or empirical science? Yes, sir. No, like if you're going to sign up, like you open up the course catalog and, uh, yeah. Interesting. So we got three up there, psychology, biology, and chemistry. Uh, what would you say? Are all three of those empirical science, hard sciences? 
two out of three. Um, which one is, would not be considered a hard empirical science? And psychology is called a what science? A, so, or a, a soft science. Um, chemistry and biology, hard sciences? Yes, OK. Um, and as we go through the list, we'll start to see exactly why they, they make that distinction between. Um, give me some more examples of hard or empirical positive science. Yes, sir? Physics, Physics yes. Physics. What else? Chemistry. Chemistry. Bi uh, biology. biology. Anatomy. Anatomy. Mm -hmm. What else? Geology. Geology. Astronomy. Astronomy. Mm -hmm. What would be some other soft sciences? Like psychology. Sociology. Um, <laughs> I don't think it goes in traditionally into either one, and we'll, we'll explain why later. But yeah, it's a good. Economics. Economics uh, I don't think that would go. I don't. Yeah, I don't think that would be more kind of theory based. Here's a trick question for you mathematics. Is it a hard science, a soft science, or neither? neither? Neither. Yeah. So the idea is, does first of all, what it, does the word empirical mean, or can you give me a synonym for empirical? That might help, because that's really what kind of defines the hard sciences, is a, an empiric an empirical method, empiricism. <laughs> no. Now we tend to think that way about empirical, but the, the very meaning of empirical is what? Ah, uh, you're getting even closer, warmer. These are things that can be true about, but yes. Empirical, what's synonymous with empirical is material or physical. And if somebody asked you, what do you mean by material physical? What's tangible and what's sensible? <coughs> So if you have a discipline dedicated to or using, <clears throat> dedicated to studying material and physical reality by means of so the methods that you employ and what you're studying is both tangible and sensible and you use these methods, you are being empirical. You're studying empirical reality versus... Non-empirical things would be ideas, theories, concepts. Because isn't it very difficult to, how many people think they could take an idea or concept and weigh it, put it on the Bunsen burner, and uh, measure it? See, concepts and ideas are very different things than empirical matter. They can be observed Recorded, measured, weighed, sensed. Yes. Yeah, through your five senses. Anything that you could detect through your five senses. And obviously, or design instrument, for example, maybe our instruments aren't s that great at detecting things, especially if I'm losing my eyesight or something like that. So what do we do? We design instruments to enhance our sensibilities, our five senses. So microscopes, telescopes, um, ways of measuring things. Yeah, good point. So why, 
you're spot on to, to identify chemistry, physics, geology, astronomy, anatomy. Um, all of these is the hard empirical sciences. Why? Because they're all studying various aspects of the material physical world. That is a world that's capable of being detected through your five senses, that's tangible, that's sensible. Well, why would psychology, sociology, anthropology, why would those be considered soft sciences? So they're still being fit into the sciences in some sense, but they're not hard empirical sciences. Why? They can change. They can change. What about the other, does chemistry and physics change? By the way, it's a good tech tactic to use even in your own reasoning. Put forth a position and then go, yeah, but what about this? Does it change? Or that's a kind of a dialectic of going back and forth to kind of narrow in. Um, yeah, you. Ah, uh, I don't know. The, the, I think there's some. <laughs> it's when it's easy. It's all soft and not hardcore. Uh, <laughs> that's pretty funny. Um, we're, I mean, kind of getting a bit closer. But think about, we identified empirical hard sciences as they are simply studying material physical reality alone. So, for example, in psychology, you might have various theories now, you might also be doing behavioral psychology and using a lot of the same methods that the hard empirical sciences use. But because you have some of these other concepts, let's say I'm a Jungian or something like that, or a Freudian or something, um, that tends to, you've got a bit of both worlds, don't you? And the same with sociology or you're studying kind of things writ large, much more than just hard empirical measurements refined, but they're using some of the scientific method that's found in that too, so they would classify them as soft sciences. Good. Um, so that basically answers how would you define science? How would you define science? The study of physical, empirical reality. And then you can make room for soft sciences that, yeah, they kind of do that too, but they have some other kind of concepts and theories that are a bit different than the, but they'll tend to use a lot of the methods that the hard empirical sciences do. Ooh, number four. Patro. That's four in Romanian. <laughs> Didn't you know you signed up for a Romanian class? What do you think is the difference between science, um, and let's just qualify here, the empirical sciences and philosophy? Yeah, it, it, yeah I wouldn't use the scientific method. That's a good, agree, disagree? If I, if I said it's good, you're probably going to be like, yeah, that's good too. I, I, that's what I believe. <laughs> um, yeah, as far as I know, although this is, this is interesting, guess who came up with the scientific method? A philosopher, Sir Francis Bacon. Isn't that interesting? So I'll create it. But I'm not going to put my hands on and I'm not going to use it. <laughs> uh, and we'll get into later why. Um, I don't want to give too much away. Uh, some of these will be answered as we go through. Who else would like to take a stab? What do you think the difference between science and philosophy is? Yes, sir. What do you guys think? That's a good 
That's pretty deep. You, I think you're a philosopher. <laughs> Who else would like to take a stab at? Yes. Yeah, that's that's good because that anticipates a question too and um, agreement within the different communities within the philosophical community versus the scientific. So I'm glad that you asked that. Good point. Okay, so. Five basically sets up for this compare and contrast. So compare and contrast, science with philosophy. And by comparing and contrasting, you can list the various attributes. Um, you could just give descriptors. Um, compare how science can be both similar yet different to philosophy. So we can say something about, what, a, for example, what does science attempt to do? Provide an answer to that and then say, well, does philosophy do the same thing? Yes, no, maybe what does, what do you think science attempts to do? Now, notice attempting to do something. I could attempt to outrun the cops. Um, doesn't mean it's going to happen. Um, so attempting to do something could be different than actually accomplishing it. So what do you think, science may not accomplish it, but what do you think it attempts to do or designed to do? Okay, good. Who else wants to? Good, yeah. And see, again, if you wanted to qualify, what do we mean by the natural world, the material physical aspect of reality? Good. What else? What does science attempt to do? So we got notions of proof using data. What is attempting to study the natural world, the material, physical world? What else? What do you think science attempts to do? Expand on ideas. Expand on ideas, so hopefully it's going to grow and progress. Anybody else? What about, can we say the same about philosophy? Does philosophy attempt to st uh, study the natural world? It may not, but does it attempt to? Uh, as far as trying to get a certain understanding, not like natural science, to get some kind of facts to understand. Okay. What do you guys think? Is there a distinction between understanding and facts? Maybe. Okay. Um, oh, that goes right into the second question. You guys, that means you're doing everything right. You're anticipating. If your answers are setting up for the next question, then you're on the right track. Is science concerned with facts? Maybe we should define, what do you think a fact is? Well, I guess you could, anybody can challenge, anybody could be a dummy that says, uh -uh, I just don't believe that one plus one is two. Um, it's like, are you challenged? I'm challenging you, bro. <laughs> uh, but you're, you're correct in saying that facts, would they change? Now, I give 1 plus 1 equals 2 because, again, hearkening back to Aristotle's saying that don't take something that's more obscure to explain something that you don't understand. Go to what's more clear. I think we all know it's pretty clear one plus one is two. It's a fact. And like I said last class, I hope to God it, we're not going to wake up tomorrow. It's going to be five and the next day seven and nine. Could you know anything if the world was, con if facts were constantly changing? Reminds me of uh, Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. It's like all the proportions are off and everything's changing and it's this kind of schizophrenic world that you'd be schizophrenic. You wouldn't be able to apprehend reality. There would be no facts if everything were changing all the time. So good. Facts, give me an example. One plus one equals two. Facts are things that are true that don't change. Um, are they dependent on people, or do facts exist whether anybody believes them or not? 
That's why I was saying anybody could challenge a fact. It just means they're being goofuses, right? Or maybe not, actually, I guess the motivation behind challenging the fact. If you want to test it, it's like, I want to see if it holds up to questioning and scrutiny. It does. This is where Descartes does. Is it a fact that I know I exist? Well, let's see if you can doubt it without contradicting yourself. Oh, surprise, you can't. So that might be a good distinction to make, too, is that, yeah, you could challenge it. You could challenge it for the purpose of securing it as knowing it's a fact. But that doesn't change whether you know it's a fact or not doesn't change, as you said, whether it's a fact or not. Because it seems to be facts are things that are true about the world independent of us. Good. Therefore, does science concern itself with facts? I like facts. Yes, I think so. Or no, do we have people that's... But it's concerned with facts, it seems so. What about philosophy? Yes, no, maybe sometimes on Mondays and Tuesdays, but not Wednesdays and Thursdays. That's interesting. Other thoughts? I think that's right. Um, maybe there's different types of facts. Okay. So you have facts and you have theories. So what do you think a theory is? Because the next question is, does science deal with theories? Are they, con are they opposed to each other? They're obviously different, facts and theories. What would you say a theory is? An unproven fact. An unproven fact. That's a theory, but can you prove it? <laughs> yes. A theory is? Um, a hypothesis presented with science. Yeah. Hypothesis over. So this is coupled together is really nice because what you have is, what is a hypothesis? You have a, a position or an assumption that is desired to be established as true or proven, but has not yet been established, um, i.e., it's a hypothesis. Okay, is science, does it deal with theories, hypotheses that need to be proven? What about philosophy? Hypotheses that need to be, ideas, assertions that need to be proven? Or does it fall out of the realm of being proven? Maybe there'd be different theories. You have a theory, you don't know how you could ever prove that. What do you guys think? Um, I'm going to say it's more inductive, so it's most likely true, but not theory. Okay, good. Um, I like to do a lot of etymology. Do you know what etymology is? The study of... The study of, Life. no, Butterfly. that's, um, oh my gosh, it's really close. It's, it starts with an E too. The study of, who has a, who has their internet? Go study of bugs. Uh, it's not endocrinology, is it? No, that's a, an, entomology, yeah. Um, etymology has to do with words. The study of the origins and meanings of words is etymology. So what we can often do, it's quite helpful, is take words and you can trace them back to their roots to find out deeper meanings of what that word implies, the history and how it's developed. So theory comes from the Greek word theoria, 
Does anybody have, and once you get the idea of the original root, what that means, then it elucidates and gives you a different kind of picture and understanding of how the modern usage of the word, where it came from, how it might have changed, what it, a kind of deeper meaning of the word. Does anybody want to take a stab at what the Greek word theoria means? Uh, no. I mean, you can ask, but it doesn't have. Okay. But it kind of looks like theology, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. The origin? The origin? Um, now, here's what's interesting. You were saying that theories are ideas that aren't proven. So they could either possibly be proven or not. Well, this is going to blow your mind. Theoria means knowledge. Isn't that funny? So typically, the way we're setting this up, the modern usage of theory, we didn't think that theory had anything to do with knowledge. They were ideas that weren't known yet or proven. But the word actually derives from theoria, which means knowledge. So that shows you, that doesn't mean that our modern usage of theory is knowledge, but it shows there's a connection and a history to the word knowledge. So that possibly, how do you work this out from etymology? Possibly theory are ideas related to knowledge in some sense. So we could just stay general. They could be not established yet, but there's ways of speaking about theories as knowledge. The theory of gravity. Um, that's, by scientific standards, that's established. It's also, but we speak of it as a theory. The theory of relativity. So there could be different usage. It's nice to know that at least it derives from the Greek word knowledge. By the way, there's tons of words for knowledge in, in Greek. There's different senses. By the way, do you know um, who the Inuits and Aleuts are? It's a group of people. It's peoples in a cold climate. Eskimos. Yes. They're two indigenous tribes of Eskimos. Do you know how many words they have for snow? Lots. Why? <laughs> Why would they... Ha- we have, um, usually in our language, uh, one word for snow. Why would the Alawite and Inuits have many words? Because they're obsessed with it. It's all around them. That's their reality. And therefore, they need different words. If your reality is surrounded with snow, well, there's different types of snow. There's different ways to approach and think about snow. Wouldn't it be nice to have different words to express that? So likewise, if you see with the Greeks, well, they have all these different words for knowledge. Are they just being redundant? No, they're obsessed with it. They are in an environment in which they're thinking about knowledge in various ways And that forces them to create different words for different types of knowledge, different ways to approach knowledge. So there is a bit of an analogy there. Okay, let's see. What did we say? Philosophy deals with theories? Okay, that's good that we did the etymology because it sets up for the next question. Is science more practical or theoretical? Um... What do you take practical to be? And again, you can ask for the etymology, and that will. But let's try to take a stab first at what practical. You see here that we're contrasting practical to theoretical. Mm-hmm. 
What would you guys say practical is? Say, that person's really practical, or this degree is really practical. Or maybe give an example. That you can practice with that degree or what that knowledge you have is in real life. Yeah, praxis, uh, sorry, uh, to practice comes from practical. Yeah. Uh, who else? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Yeah, you're on the right track. Keep going. Yeah, like, kind of like what you were saying too. If it's realistic, then what do you mean by that? It's practical in the sense that I'm going to get paid. I'm going to get, get something out of this. I'm going to do something with. Okay, uh, who else? Somebody else had a hand up. Practical, yes, sir. Logical, okay. So, how is that different than theoretical? Could you say theoretical is very logical? Oftentimes, people think that practical is more certain and objective, and theoretical is less certain. And but that's not really the again going back to. Theoretical is relating to a type of knowledge. The word practical comes from the Greek word praxis. And praxis, let's pop this up here for you. Distinguish from theory. Interesting. Um, I wanted to find more of the the Greek. An action, practice, as you'd mentioned, such as an exercise or the practical application of a theory. So what you will see here is that the Greeks actually saw praxis is a type of knowledge. But as, and I think all of, some of you have already hit on this, a kind of applied knowledge. If you have a set of skill, I have a very special set of skills. <laughs> it just like popped in my mind when I said that. Wouldn't it be cool if you could just queue up like lines from movies? And just be like, oh, I have a very special skills that I can exercise on you if you don't give me my daughter back <laughs> who was taken from me. Now go see my new movie, Taken 2. They're, those are fun movies to watch though, aren't they? Um, they distinguish that between praxis and paresis is another Greek word for theoretical knowledge. So you have knowledge that, and this is how the ancients thought about knowledge. Unlike us today, this is exactly why parents and different people say, why are you studying philosophy? What can you do with that? What, what kind of job? Well, what they're thinking is that the only type of knowledge is practical, a knowledge that can be applied. And that it's only worthwhile if you can do something. And here we have a distinction between desiring something because you could do something with it, you can use it, versus desiring something simply for the sake that it's beautiful and you want to enjoy it. Now, if you don't make this distinction, you can run into problems. Think about this. Somebody asks you, why do you love your parents? And you say, because I can use them to get things. Um, um, that sounds perverted in some sense, right? It doesn't seem correct. Now, if you said, there is no practical reason why I love my parents. They're lovable in their own right. That is a sufficient answer. My parents deserve to be loved. They're my parents. You don't need a further, it's an end. 
and versus means. Are you treating your parents as means or as an end? Sometimes maybe about both. But what should you do? It seems correct that we should say, no, our parents should be desired and loved as an end in themselves. Once you get to an end, you're desiring this, it's the end. It's, you don't say, well, because I want it for this and this. Now, think about the opposite. Why do you want money? Yeah, is a means to if, survive. To Why do you want to survive? So, again, now if you said, because I want it, I just like collecting it. You know you're not going to do anything with it. No, it's just beautiful. Um, that's weird. You'd feel that that's a tragedy because it's like we could do something with that. Why? Because money and currency is not an end in its own right. It's a means for something else. And you get all screwed up when you treat it as an end. And when you get these categories confused, when you start using parents and loving them as because they're a means and not an end, or vice versa, you treat money as an end and not a means, then things go wrong. So it's good to know that the Greeks made this distinction too. And generally the way they thought about knowledge, unlike us moderns, is that why do we go to school to learn? If you asked a modern today, they would say, so you can get a job, so you can do these things. And so they've redefined knowledge solely to be practical, that this is off the table now. But the ancients had a different understanding of knowledge. They would say it's like your parents. It's desire. It's beautiful. Knowledge is beautiful and desirable in its own right. Art is the same way. Now, I know you can make art into a commodity. But definitionally speaking and traditionally speaking, art is the least practical discipline out there. Why do you produce it? Yeah, you could make money, but that's not why you produce art. It's because a sufficient answer would be because it's beautiful. Because people desire beauty in its own right. There's nothing to do with it. You don't make or do anything with a beautiful piece of art. You aesthetically enjoy it. Why? Because it's an end in its own right. These are things that the ancients called transcendentals. And knowledge was one of those. Why do you go to school? The first answer should be because it's worthwhile just getting knowledge even if you don't do anything with it. Why? Because it's beautiful. It's true. And it's good. There's a famous Latin phrase, bonum veritas pulcherum, the good, the beautiful, and the true. That's why you want to. Now you, once you have that general kind of outlook in life that I don't need to do anything with knowledge. It's an end in its own right, but I can. Now you can start to divide up different disciplines. There is some knowledge that you would acquire that would want to be applied. Some just to be enjoyed. If it's just to be enjoyed in its own right, it's theoretical knowledge. If it's knowledge to be applied or used, it's practical. And we can even divide up the disciplines into what would you say is a very practical degree? Knowledge that you acquire primarily for the purposes to use, to be applied. Yeah, engineering is the first one I think of. So you learn mathematics for the sake of applying it to understanding structures and weights and supports and things like that, correct? Um, what's another practical discipline and degree? Medicine. Medicine. So here you learn um, the science of biology and anatomy and uh, health so that you can apply that to healing people. Hopefully, right? We're not making them sicker. We're healing them um, if you're doing it correct. What about mathematics? Is it a theoretical or practical discipline? Practical, theoretical. So I don't mean mathematics as an engineer. An engineer will study mathematics. I'm saying, like, I'm a mathematician. I study numbers and magnitudes. 
if you ask them, why do you do that? What do you think they'd say? So I can build stuff? So I can perform uh, health on people? A mathematician will say, what are you talking about? Do, any, do nothing with it. It's, <laughs> I enjoy numbers. Um, it's a theoretical discipline. It's pure theory. So are you starting to get the differences, the, the usage of theory versus praxis? That knowledge that you acquire because you want to apply it. Now, you may use different disciplines. For example, if you're an engineer or a scientist, you're going to borrow from the field of mathematics and learn that not as a mathematician, per se, but as an engineer, learning mathematics to be applied, and therefore your discipline is practical. If you're a mathematician, you're not learning about numbers to do or make anything. You're like the artist. I love numbers. I don't need another answer. I study it because mathematicians think it's beautiful, because it's true. What would you say philosophy? Is it more practical or theoretical, a bit of both? Theoretical, and the empirical sciences? For the, probably for them, yeah. They use, yeah. Okay, let's go to, now notice the next question is not what does it uh, attempt to do, what do you think science actually accomplishes? Does it accomplish anything? Makes life easier. Yeah. yeah. So technology is produced by what? Science. Um, what else does science accomplish? It can make things easier. Can it make things harder? Yeah, I mean, it can make studying harder. <laughs> yeah. You can understand things better. Okay, it leads us to, so it helps us get a better apprehension of truth. What about philosophy? What does philosophy accomplish? Understanding. Okay. Um, does it make life easier? By the way, the word tech, I like to use the word technology. Science is concerned. Technology comes from the Greek word techne, where you get technique. But is the skills, and again, it's very closely associated with praxis, practical knowledge. Why? Because techne can be the art or the skills. acquired and used by the artist. It's concerned with making and doing. Techne. So if you think about skills or tools, this is technology. Not be great technology, but it, is it not a tool? And what do you do with a tool? You just contemplate? Wow. What am I going to do with nothing? Just behold the tool. Um, no, you use tools. Obviously, why do you want to use tools? Well, I guess I could get a chisel and start trying to write up the... Today's lecture on the, well, we got to get a big stone slab too. And, but now life's hard. <laughs> so somebody says, hey, I got a brilliant idea. Let's use better technology. Really? Yeah, look at, we can take ink and a whiteboard and write up on the, and then somebody's like, why even do that? 
we'll just hook this computer, we'll just upload your brain up to the cloud, and we'll just have you think your thoughts on the, and you can just sit there and not move at all. That sounds much easier. It's like, wow, technology is advancing. It's making life easier. Um, now, I die of heart disease because uh, I'm not exercising. I'm just sitting there, and uh, so it ends up making life maybe a little bit more difficult later. Um, so you have to make more technology to um, give me a, a new heart so I don't die of, I joke, but not really. <clears throat> So it's good to know that, yeah, that practical knowledge is concerned and related to technology. Technology comes from techne, which is the art, the skills of the artisan, the tools used to produce or make something. That's where it comes from. So science produces technology. Why? Because, as you'd rightly and correctly pointed out, it's more practical. It's acquiring knowledge. Science uses mathematics. Why? So it can apply it, make stuff, do stuff. Um, although there, it, there might be some th theoretical knowledge involved too, that there's stuff about science that just desired to be known because it's true. What about philosophy? More practical or theoretical? What would you say? Theoretical? It's like, um, you ever heard of somebody who has their head in the clouds? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I never could figure that out. There was this person that kept saying, fly boy. Like, okay, there was a uh, lost in translation kind of thing. And I'm like, that means I... <laughs> probably something different in English, right? Like fly. He's fly. Um, and so I was like, what are, you, what are you saying? And the person says, oh, you're a philosopher. Like, you're flying. I'm like, yeah, I'm not getting that. I'm not a pilot. I'm a, no, you're not, <laughs> you're not getting it. Your head's always in the clouds um, like you're flying, like a fly. I'm like, isn't that funny how, like, you try to, like, translate these things from different cultures? And it's like, fly boy? Like, are you kidding and there's a whole thing where, like, you've seen where, like, uh, like food places in different countries that, that don't quite translate the English correctly. And you were like, oh, man. <laughs> there's, like, a whole site that has, like, a list of, like, it's like, I would never eat there. <laughs> so philosophy is more head in the clouds. Is this person right? Or can you think of any aspect of philosophy that would be practical? Knowledge that you would apply. Would this be like just like Chinese proverbs or just proverbs in general? Like what they're saying is what I'm talking about? That's interesting because that actually, you might be right, that might relate to, so ethics, um, is a branch of philosophy. What is ethics dealing with? Moral yeah, right living, correct human behavior, morality, this, you know, the discipline study of morality. So you might actually be correct in saying that, well, aren't there, can't you study wisdom um, and know things to be applied in your life so that you live correctly and well? You treat others well. Um, that could be, but I think you're probably right. For the most part, it tends to stay in the realm of theory. That they're desirable just simply because they're an end in their own right. They want to be, it's true, it's beautiful. Now, what about the issue of objectivity and subjectivity? First, let's see what you guys think. What does objective versus subjective mean? So 
something subjectively true versus objectively true, or that's subjective, but this is objective, what would you say? Yes. Good. So actually, that's a great definition for um, something objective is what in philosophy observer independent facts. Uh, give me an observer independent fact. So that means, and remember what we said a fact is, you could say it's synonymous with, let's just do this squiggly line. True. Fact is true. Now there's some quibble over whether there's a distinction between things that are true versus facts are truths that have been established. But we'll just leave that for, for now. The Earth has a sun. Is that a fact that's independent of any observers? And by observers, that's us people. The, yeah, exactly. So does the sun immediately, does the earth immediately have a sun only when people are here to observe it? It's there regardless. So we consider it as an objective. It's an objective fact. So if you don't believe that, it just means you're objectively wrong. If you're like, the earth has no sun, there is no sun. It's like, well, you're wrong. It's why? Because it's not dependent on people, or subjects, or observers, it's independent. Yeah, you've heard that one. If a tree falls in the forest and nobody's here, there to hear it, does it make a sound? It's a trick question. It's not even that philosophical at all. It's actually a grammatical... What do you think? Does it, if nobody's there, does it make a sound? Okay, well, let's just not do... Philo let's just do grammar. By the way, philosophy uses grammar to... You know, people are, you know, they write like on Facebooks or texts and the grammar is like terrible and you point that out to them and they're like, it don't matter because you know what I'm saying. It's like, no, actually, that's why we use grammar is because you've seen those funny things where they don't put the commas in and it like completely ends up being a total different meaning. Well, when you study grammar for the purposes of exegesis, understanding text, it's quite important because sometimes we get stuck and we don't know what it's saying. You have to break down the grammar. For example, sound. If a tree falls in a forest and there's nobody to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, I want to know what sound is. What is sound? Okay, but um, what kind of, there's all kinds of vibrations in the air that might not be sound. But you're close, you're like, that would be the first part. Vibrations traveling through the air. And I just qualify what kind of vibrations that you can hear. So let's retranslate this sentence. Instead of using sound, we'll just use vibra vibrations that can be heard. If a tree falls in the forest and there is no one to hear the tree, does it make a sound? In other words, does it make vibrations that are heard? In other words, if there's no one to hear the tree, is it heard? <laughs> sound, sound waves, sound are waves that are heard. Okay, 
So it's a trick question. Of course not. If, that's, if there's nobody to hear, there's no hearing. Um, but see how important grammar breaking that down to, well, what does that word mean? That's an example of... Yeah, well, I mean, if we, so it might have been better to say that instead of can be heard, because I think the way that science, there's all kinds of waves, percussion waves, uh, light waves, um, we sound waves, but I think they would actually say not only that it's capable of being heard, but that it actually is heard. So sound becomes sound when it is heard. Prior to that, it's just a wave like anything else or a vibration or something like that. So it might have been, I think you're right, better to say vibrations that are heard. If the tree falls in the forest and there's no one to hear, are the vibrations heard? No. Easy. I win, you lose is what you say. No, I'm kidding. Don't say that. <laughs> but yeah, do you see it's a trick? Um, but that. It sounds like I'm going off on a tangent, but I'm not because I'm going to bring it right back. Yeah, so if, if you made it, if you, if you define it that way, I'd say you're correct. But I'm thinking because the way science typically would define it is sound is what's heard. Um, let, we could change it to sight because we have sight, sound, taste. If there's nobody to taste the burger, does it taste? <laughs> it's like, mm, definitely no. It's not. The, I mean, we could tweak it and be like, it can be tasted if there was somebody. But then we're just kind of going back to where we started from. Um, if there's no one to see, is there sight? If there is no one to hear, is there sound? No, there might be the things available, like <laughs> percussion waves such that if there were the right type of organs to receive that and process it, then there would be sound and things heard, but not unless there are hearers can things properly be said to be heard, i.e. sound. Good one. So the reason why I bring that up is that let's go to the notion of subjective. What does subjective mean as opposed to objective? What's that? An opinion? What else? Opinion can be sometimes translated as just mere belief. It could be a true belief, a false belief, unproven belief, i.e. it's an opinion. That's your opinion, man. What movie is that from? You know? Big Lebowski. Extra, extra credit points. Okay. Uh, what else do we say about subjective? Subjective could be biased. It could be, yeah. It almost always is actually by its very definition. Um, if objective is observer independent, subjective would be what? Observer or by observer we mean the subject. Dependent. Well, that's interesting. Notice what two words are in those two words. What do you see? You see me drop my pen. Is what you see. Oh. Ah. Can you see what I underline? In the word objective, you find what word? Object and in the word subjective, you find what word? Subject. Um, there's a reason why. It's no coincidence. You have a distinction between objects and subjects as far as truth values goes. When we said the earth.
has a son, grammatically, what are we modifying? What, what are we referring to? Subjects, peoples, or what are these things called? Objects. Why? Because objective means independent, observer independent truths, facts. But when you have things that it could be true, it could just be, it could be untrue. But when it's related to the observer, when it's a quality that doesn't exist in objects, but in people and subjects, then you start to develop the notion of what subjectivity is. Now, let me give you an example. You've already qualified that the statement, the earth has a sun, or you could give the distance, is an objective fact or truth. Um, let me give you some more, and you tell me, is it subjective or objective? Uh, pad thai is the best tasting food in the universe. Wrong! <laughs> Subjective, why? Uh, well, here we're really modifying the notion of taste. Now, where does taste exist? Oh, I just stepped in some taste. No, it's not an object that I could step in like some poo-poo, right? It's, it's what, where does taste exist? Not outside of me. Yeah. Um, it's more of a psychological phenomenon, too. For some people, maybe pad thai tastes like poo-poo. Um, why? And then somebody says, that's because it's subjective. Um, blue should be worn and only worn on Thursday. Why? Because it's the best color for Thursday. Um, objective or subjective? So now I have c color preferences. Okay. I don't think it's objectively moral or immoral that I wore blue today. Um, although, for example, we could take certain things that are subjective and see them in objective ways. For example, is it objectively wrong to run around naked? Where, Where exactly? <laughs> Here you do it, you're going to go to jail, um, and you're wrong, <laughs> objectively wrong to run around. Be why? Because that's not acceptable in our culture. We've decided that we have laws against stuff like that. Um, now, let's say we're in the Amazon. Are we going to tell the natives that have probably never even seen modern people before? that uh, you're wrong. You're wrong for being naked. Um, objectively, no, because you have this kind of cultural. Now, does it, so here you have issues like dress preferences, color and stuff like that that would be subjective, but that could be objective. If you put that into the wrong context, that is objectively in the wrong context. You don't run around naked like an Amazonian at Fullerton College. I think we know that it's objectively true. Um, and I probably don't even need any people to tell me that, right? It's kind of almost, in one sense, observer-independent fact, although it's dependent on an issue of subjectivity. Does that make sense? So we're just, I'm just kind of making some distinctions there. So these are important things that, um, to d distinguish between, is it subjective? Well, does it relate to and exist solely within the person? Or is it something that typically would be considered to be universal? Universal is different than opposed to particular. Well, what do I mean by that? Human beings. Is that a particular or a universal? Particular. You are a particular human being. You are a particular human being. You are a particular. So it's either particular means singular or just a, a small group. 
universal is the class of all. So the concept or the name human being is, a, is universal. Why? Because it includes every individual of that set that can be called human being. Each one of you is a particular example of the universal set of all human beings. Immutable means mutatis in Latin is to change. If you ever see the word un, the prefix is un, im, in, unambiguous, um, immortal. Um, those are negative prefixes. So it's saying not. Not mutable means not changeable, unchangeable. So typically we consider things that are objective are universal. That means you can't say that it's like something subjective. The fact that the earth has a sun is not just true for us in the northern hemisphere, but everybody in the southern hemisphere. And across the universe. Therefore, objectivity is universal. It's also, now we'd have to qualify that because you could destroy the, the sun and now it doesn't have a sun. But once you put it in the time frame, in, in tense, the earth now has a sun. Um, that fact is unchangeable. You'd have to change the tense. Uh, just like 1 plus 1 equals 2 is immutable. It's not going to change. I think my pen's running out. So objective, universal, immutable, and absolute. Whereas subjective things deal with particulars, persons, i.e. subjects, and can be mutable and are not and not absolute. Now that we've set that up and got a clear kind of understanding of the differences between what we call subjective and objective, science, um, and I think you're right, you, a synonym could be facts versus, as one of you pointed out, opinions, which in Greek, the word opinion is doxa. Science. Is it objective or subjective? Objective? This. Now let's do the pushback. So science is universal. It's true for all people at all times. It's immutable. Does it change? Uh-oh. Science changes all the time. That might be a problem. How many people know who Ptolemy is? Ptolemy from, from Egypt, actually. Uh, astronomer? The geocentric universe. The Earth is a center. Now, that's fact, right? It's not the sun. <laughs> But it was scientific fact for a very, very long time. I thought science is objective. It doesn't change. How many elements do we have in the periodic chart? Four? Four elements? Fire, air, earth, and water? Uh, we've, science has changed. Okay, I'm just giving you some pause to think about, what about philosophy? More objective or subjective? More subjective? So is it concerned with 
particular like taste preferences of existing persons. Now, typically we say that because it gets to this question about guaranteeing certitude and whether that requires agreement with an, as a whole. If you go into, and we'll end with this, if you go into a philosophy department and knock on every door of the philosophy professors and ask them some philosophical questions, you're going to get entirely different answers. Does God exist? Um, is the universe uh, eternal? Um, what's the correct moral or political theory? Um, is it just all matter? Are there immaterial entities, abstract entities? It's all going to be across the board. Well, you might think that that's, you know, psychologically speaking, that sounds kind of a little bit like pad thai and burgers, and everybody has these different preferences. Whereas in science, you go into any science department and ask them how many elements of the periodic chart. It is 131. Is that or is it, yeah, 131? Or is it 126? I'm always getting the numbers mixed up. We're going to get the standard answer. Hydrogen has how many electrons? That's your opinion, man. Uh, probably not going to hear that. I think it has five. Well, that's your opinion. Why? Because there's universal agreement. That tends to psychologically at least produce the... A phenomena of thinking, well, it must be, if there's universal agreement, it must be because it's universal. It can't be changed, and it's absolute and therefore objective. Is that necessarily true? That just because people disagree and have different answers means it's not objective? Or if everybody agrees on something, does it mean that it's objectively true? We've probably seen some terrible regimes in history that have thought universally some pretty bad things. And they all agreed that it was objectively true. Does it make it right? Just because you get, for example, if I went around and passed out a question of uh, 3 plus 4, 3 plus 3 equals, and I get a different answer from every single one of you, am I, should I throw up my hands and be like, that's because it's an opinion. If I'm getting a different response, that's because for you, maybe it's four. And for you, I think uh, it's two. Uh, we'd think I was insane to say that. We'd just say, no, everybody's objectively wrong, unless somebody got the right answer. But at least we know not everybody can be correct if they're giving a different answer to something that we intuitively know is objective. So just because we're getting different answers doesn't mean that it's necessarily subjective. And vice versa, is truth a matter of a vote? Is that what makes something true? Well, no, because you told me truth is observer independent. We hope that people would line up their ideas and their minds such that they agree and conform to what is true, but that very rarely happens. And for various reasons. For example, what if I paid you off to give different answers? That could be a motivation. Or what if it wasn't 3 plus 3 equals 6? What if I told you to compute the limit of some function? Do you think I'm going to get the same answer across the board? No, because now you're getting more difficult. You might be getting into mathematics that not everybody's uh, had a chance to study. Well, likewise, you might think about that when it comes to philosophy, of course you're going to get different answers. In part, it could be because of the difficulty matter. It could, there could be different reasons. There could be motivating reasons. Um, there could be biases. For example, there might be a reason why somebody doesn't want to accept a certain political ideology or philosophy um, because of certain experiences. That might have nothing to do with whether it's actually true or not or whether they're right. So that's something to think about. The door slammed loud and rose up the cloud of dust on earth. Footsteps fall.